Alrighty, it's time for another live stream. So things have been going on, and I definitely want to share them with y'all. Where is my conversation box with you guys? It's always here, and now it's gone. So funny, every week there's some little tiny thing that changes that I didn't approve of. So that part looks right. Hmm. Where would your conversations be? That's overlays, sound, effects. Try YouTube. Yeah, that part's right. Anyway, I can't even see if you guys are responding yet because my box is missing and it makes no sense why. So I apologize for making you wait. should jump to live demo mode, huh? Wait, does that change anything? Nope. Uh, comments. There you are. Hey, everybody. Oh, my goodness. There's a whole bunch of people here. Yay. So I apologize for that. I don't know why that box evaporated, but it's back on the screen where it belongs. So I'll start off with a few shout outs because you're on my screen. So Shane, howdy, howdy. Someone from Belgium is on here. Saveki, Saveki's Reef, hi. First, didn't quite say t, but he was third. <laughs> hi, Brad, hey, Eric, uh, Vinny, Lance. H2O-N-A-C-L, man, what does that stand for? Uh, Gary Brown, 210. Hi, Andrea. Yeah, I uh, I was trying to get things set up, and I thought, no problem, I'm one minute away, and then of course it always takes five minutes. So I want to kind of preface this with, uh, I'm slightly under the weather, and I feel kind of cruddy, but I'm going to do the best I can with you guys today. And hopefully we have decent sound quality, uh, you know, I'm always trying to make sure that's right. And I wanted to jump into just a, a quick little thing, this week I left briefly to go to Salt Lake City and there to uh, film at the aquarium and did an interview with them, got behind the scenes. It's a massive undertaking to film this place and so it's going to take a long time to edit. <laughs> and I know you're thinking, oh great, we'll never see, but you will. So I'm kind of hoping that one will be ready in about a month. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, I should be able to, hmm, how can I do this? I have an idea, but I need a wire to do it. Okay, let's see what happens if I plug this in. You know, I move everything out of my way, and then when it's time to film, I need things. <laughs> so let's see if I can add my own to my, oh, didn't expect that. Get that off the screen. We don't need that. Um, I want to see, oh yeah, I got this, okay, great. So, what do I have on here I can show you guys? Photos. Breaking up, uh, it's possible that the wire is getting hit by the back. Let's try this, see if that's any better. I'm gonna move the location of the receiver. It's probably me smashing it against my belt. So we'll see if that's better, hopefully. We'll give it a 20 seconds for you guys to decide. Well, what would be the easiest way to show you this? Hmm, maybe a text. like my shirt <laughs> is the sound better now or is it still crackly okay seems good yeah I think I was just leaning against it I apologize guys 
All right, so I'm just going to throw on my screen really quick here a picture for you guys. So let's see if I can zoom in on this. Come on. Why is it? I do all this stuff when I'm offline, and it won't let me zoom. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. So here are, we are inside the jaws of a shark, and uh, it's an actual, uh, it's, a, it's a model. <laughs> it's not uh, a physical jawbone. I actually asked that question. And inside, at the lower, uh, the bottom guy here, in the dark shirt in the front, next to me is uh, Michael, who is the senior marine biologist there. And so I interviewed him. Behind him is Jeremy from Benner Reef, and then a couple more guys from the aquarium. Oh, in the very back with the glasses, on the far right was my cameraman. And let me tell you guys, that was awesome. Having someone to actually follow me around with a camera, make sure the sound levels were good, make sure the lighting was good, frame the shot. Oh, I could, well, I would love to be spoiled that way and do that all the time. That would be so amazing because I find that a lot of the things I do are static shots. They're tripod driven. Uh, and I have to, of course, run over and double check it and then come back in front of the camera like I'm doing right now to talk to you. And, you know, then after I'm done, I have to hit play and make sure it came out okay. Do we have to do it again? So having that second person, oh, so nice. And that made me very happy. He also, um, I'm going to find another picture here that he shared with me last night. So let's see, where's the easiest way to find this? So I shared this to my Milo's Reef page, which would be <clears throat> this one here. <clears throat> if you're not following that page on Facebook right now, you should be, because there's a lot of things that get shared there. So I'm waiting for this to load. Here we go. My goodness, it's like showing me everything but what I want to see. All right, here we go. So and I'll put this back on the screen again. So this was Benepitz had posted this, and if you look way down there, <laughs> that light blue shirt is me and Michael, and we're under a full-size, life-size whale shark. And of course there's manta rays, and this is the gift shop in the front. And then there was a behind the scenes here, where you can see the cameraman was working, which was awesome. His name was Mike also, Michael. And then we're above a reef tank right here in this shot. And then there was another one here where I'm on top of the reef tank. So you can kind of see what it was like. You can kind of get a view there. Of, and then here's a, a good picture of the reef from above, which is really pretty. And the coral colonies you're looking at there are about two foot across. So it kind of gives you a, a size. All right, so anyway, that's what I did this weekend. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Thursday. And I got back Friday, and maybe that's why I'm under the weather, because I was on an airplane, and, uh, you know, you're around all the germs. They always say that. So, I mean, there's a chance. Maybe I'm just tired. I don't know. I work really hard. So uh, it was a great trip. It was a whirlwind trip. I flew in at 4 in the morning, and by noon the next day, I was home. And I also got to film Bradley's Tank, which uh, I share his uh, uh, aquarium on Facebook.com slash Milo's Reef as well. So I would encourage you guys, of course, to follow that page because you know I try to share one interesting thing a day on there. Uh, usually it's something I came across, something I like. You know, of course I'm gonna post things that I sell, but I don't inundate you. I'm not gonna advertise you guys to death, so never fear of that. <laughs> Fun with the reefing says, you look like you got out of the shower. Well, I took a shower an hour and a half ago, and uh, the shirt is not my PJ shirt, it is my happy shirt because I was thinking aquatic things and kind of wanted to wear something to be a little cooler in, so I went with that. All right, so someone asked, how much does your tank cost to run? He's ready to go to the topic. So I wanted to show you a little bit of homework that I've done, and I'm going to go through the details, but I want to explain to you how it is to measure your tank. Now, there's a couple of methods on the market that you're able to do. For example, you can buy the newer Apex, the 832, and every single outlet has power monitoring, which means it actually measures the wattage of that item plugged in when it's on, and we'll report it instantly and show you the watts being used. So you can look at one through eight, and you can look and see this one uses 200 watts, this one uses nine watts, this uses one watt, this one uses 18 watts. And the other thing you can do with those numbers, besides just knowing some watts, you can actually set a code that will inform you via text or email if it's not the normal wattage amount. 
So for example, let's say your pump always pulls 150 watts and suddenly it's pulling 18 or it's pulling 300 or some random number that's not normal. That would be a good way to notify you there may be a problem with the pump. It could be that it's obstructed, you know, clogged up somehow. It could be that it's failing or it could be that it's literally died. So it's another way to be informed with your aquarium. So that's convenient. And then there are other monitoring services, uh, you know, different aquarium controllers that probably have those measurements. I don't know. But I want to show you this guy right here. So this is a simple thing called a kilowatt. I've shown on my channel before. You plug it into your wall. And uh, of course, it has a ground prong, uh, the ground prong for plugging in so you're grounded. And then across the display here, you can select amps, volts, watts. And you can even put in what your price is for electricity, and it'll tell you the math. It'll do the math instantly and tell you what it cost for that item you plugged in. So the thing's kind of large, and my solution is a one-foot extension cord that I just plug in the back of this, and then I plug it into my outlet where my item is plugged in. And you don't have to do exactly what I'm doing here, but this is just my method. So if I have a protein skimmer plugged in outlet number one, I will unplug the skimmer, I'll plug this into that spot where the outlet was, and then I'll plug the skimmer into this. And I will measure the wattage used by the skimmer in that port. And this is the part of saying you don't have to copy. When I'm done, I unplug this and I plug the skimmer back in. I go to port number two and I plug this in and put two in here. But I guess technically you could just plug it into any outlet or an extension cord or whatever. Well, not an extension cord. You want to be a wall outlet because you don't want to lose a lot of, um, you don't want resistance to throw off the numbers. Because if power is going through a very long cable, it can, it can actually need to pull more power. But anyway, you could plug this into one thing and then systematically unplug, plug in, measure, unplug, plug in, next item, measure, and just do this one after another. But I choose to plug mine into each of the outlets I'm using also to double check that the outlet is operating correctly. That it's got, because it'll show me, as soon as you plug it in, it'll show you the watts being used. I'm sorry, the uh, volts. <laughs> I think that's right. I always say, <laughs> I hate it when I say things wrong. I think it's right. I think it's volts. So it'll show like 121 point something. I'm like, okay, we're good. And then I hit the watts button. So now that I've shown you how I do that, here are the measurements I did on my frag system. And I chose the frag system, number one, because I only had to deal with eight outlets <laughs> or well, 10 instead of, you know, whatever my reef uses, which I feel is going to be like 30 or 40 items. And my reef is so much bigger than most of your tanks. So I thought, let me deal with something smaller. My frag system is a 60 gallon frag system with a sump, protein skimmer, top off system, refugium lighting, a heater, dosing pumps. I mean, that's pretty much a standard thing for a lot of people. So here's the breakdown. The protein skimmer was pulling nine watts of power, which is nothing. That's the tiniest NIOS skimmer. The Neotherm pulls 95 watts and that was a hundred watt heater. So it was a little bit less than a hundred. The Vectra return pump was pulling 67 watts. The Smart ATO, when it's running, is pulling 5 watts, but of course most of the time it's turned off, so that doesn't really count as an expense. Uh, the Nero 5 is on all the time, and that's using 23 watts. The Lumalite, which is on for maybe 8 hours a day, is pulling 12 watts. The dosing, oh, under my where my tubing goes into my sump, I have an itty bitty little power head that blows water straight upward, and so as the water or I'm sorry the alkalinity the calcium magnesium are trickling in it is being instantly mixed up so I have a little tiny circulation pump for dosing it uses seven watts and then the dosing pumps themselves appear to use about two watts each then of course lighting so I have two radion pros I'm sorry two radions one is a gen 2 and then one is a gen 3 pro and the gen 2 is an XR30 which is the one with two LED assemblies and that one uses 27 watts and then my Gen 3 Pro is an XR15, so it only has the one light assembly, and it used 18 watts. So now that we know the watts that are being used, you can figure out the hours per day. Like, for example, my protein skimmer runs uh, 9 watts times 24 hours a day. So it's going to pull a total of 216 watts of electricity. The radions, let's just take those and add them together. So I'll take 27 watts plus 18 watts, and we'll just say times eight hours a day because I'm just doing it off the top of my head. That would be 360 watts for the day. 
and then you know so we've got our two items you know we've got our 216 watts and we've got our 360 watts and I'm just taking just the lights in the skimmer that's 576 watts per hour I, I take that back per day that's what it is 576 times 30 days is 17280 1 2 3 4 yeah that comes out to 1.7 kilowatts <clears throat> that I'm using per per month for that tank in just those two items the lights and the skimmer and once you add in the heater and you the thing about the heater is you have to figure out how many times it came on that day now if you have a controller to track it you can say okay it was only on a total of 6 hours out of 24 so you know it used 95 watts for six hours. <clears throat> but once you know the kilowatts you've used, then you can go to your calculator and say, well, how much does a kilowatt cost me? And mine is uh, 0.62, which is nice and cheap, times 1.7. And we'll go all the way up to 280. And uh, that will then give you the consumption of what that cost. And based on my quick math here, it appears that just my radio and lights and my skimmer is costing me just over a dollar, a dollar seven a month to run in electricity. And that kind of makes sense because it's a small tank and I'm only talking about those. I didn't add the return pump. I didn't add the heaters. I didn't add all the other things, uh, the circulation pump. But we obviously want all of those numbers to get to a total number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compile all my numbers, get it all organized, and I'll put a blog about it on my website. So I would definitely invite you guys to visit my website from time to time. Let's see, I made this new thing. Hey, look, that's pretty. <laughs> it's on top of my head. I'm gonna move it over here to right about down here. How about that? So uh, the website itself, when you go there, there are some big graphics you can click on. One of them says blog, reef blog. Just click on that and it'll take you to my latest blog entries. And I put, you know, I don't know, two, three blogs a month. You know, I try to only post things that are interesting. So it's not just super crazy boring. Like today I dosed alkalinity. <laughs> who cares you know but if I said I switched and such and such happened that's blog worthy so I try to talk about things that I think are interesting and otherwise you know it probably doesn't become a blog entry it might just be a simple status update on Facebook so uh, I hope that that kind of made sense and I would love to answer your questions on what you might want to figure out with your electricity and I realize you're in different countries Maybe they have a device made like this for Europeans with a correct outlet on the back, for example. But it would be great to actually know. And so, like I said, I will do all my tanks. I will compile all the information. And I'm going to actually do an energy audit for 2019 because I haven't done that in a couple of years. And it's always nice to know what everything's pulling. I want to know what my halides are pulling. I want to know um, what my dosing pumps are pulling. You know, I just want to, you know, I mean, even the dose search to my calcium reactor. That's a new power source. And the Trident is a new thing plugged in. Trident is part of the Apex, though I probably can't measure its power usage. That's okay. But I'll just do the best I can. Um, yes, Ben Border asked, point, mine is 0.62, six, it's 6.2 cents per kilowatt hour. I, my electricity here is very cheap. All right. Um, Thoric David asked, why did you throw a tang in your anemone cube? I thought tangs need lots of room. Well, when I got the tang, he was one inch long and he was super adorable and he was bright blue. And him against the backdrop of everything else that was either brown or green or red was amazing. But the tang is getting too large and I need to catch her. And I'm gonna have to actually put a fish trap in there and catch her and she is super skittish. I just walk up to the tank and she goes into the rock work. So catching her will not be easy or fun. And then once I've trapped her, I've got to put her somewhere. And I'm not going to put her in my reef because hippo tangs are known to chew on zoanthids. And I don't want to put her in there. So she will probably end up in my frag system, which is a 60 gallon long. So she's got, you know, a few feet to swim back and forth. And she's still small. You know, she's maybe three inches long. So moving her there would be nicer. And she won't have to dodge tentacles for the rest of her life either, which will be good. So that's going to happen. Uh, someone asked me about my mermaid. I got her from Comic-Con. She was made by a... Um, uh, a famous artist, J. Scott Campbell, who does amazing cartoon art, like cover art for comics. 
and he designed the adult version of the Little Mermaid, and uh, I wanted that statuette really badly, and it took months to get. There was only a limited amount of them made, and it was on my wish list, and I, uh, I finally got it. And of course, she's under an acrylic cover made at Milo's Reef to keep her nice and clean. So that was really fun. And she's been here for months. It's just usually she's off camera because of the angles of this room, and you just haven't seen her. So. Uh, Jay asks, what's the most important thing to run on a battery backup or a UPS for your Nano? I would say your circulation, um, especially circulation. Um, if you're in a power outage situation, you want the water to keep moving for oxygen reasons. And then possibly, depending on the temperature of the room, because when the power is out, the room might get hotter and hotter if it's summer, or it could get really cold at night uh, you know, in the winter. So you may have to run a fan to help cool the tank. If you can't do something simple as float a frozen 20 ounce bottle in your aquarium to bring the temperature down. Uh, in the winter, we wrap our tanks with a blanket <laughs> during the power outage to kind of contain the heat a little bit. But uh, circulation is more important. Lighting does not matter. Your tank can go a couple of days without lights. I know no one wants to hear that, but it actually can. So I wouldn't worry about lighting. I wouldn't worry about skimmers and reactors or anything like that. I would just keep the circulation moving in the tank. And of course, check on it constantly and make sure everything's good. If uh, you can't do uh, the circulation pumps, they're just pulling too much power, you could then go to battery powered air pumps. <clears throat> uh, you can get an air pump that plugs into a battery backup or UPS, and that would be nice. Uh, uh, for me, it's all about circulation. All right. Um. Yeah. Uh, the electricity rates, they vary, uh, and I think I had this conversation last week. I know I was talking with other people about it. I thought it was on the stream, but electricity in Texas is deregulated, and we get to pick our companies every single year, and I always pick a one-year contract, and I look at all of the prices, and I look for the best deal I can get, and I lock it in for 12 months, and the rate I'm at right now is actually locked in for 23 months because I went through a special agency. They contacted me and said, we want to help you with your power. And I thought, no, no, I got it, I got it, because I didn't know. Um, I, I just, you know, everything's a scam these days, right? And I just, you know, I have trust issues. And so I went ahead and I, I said, I'll take care of it. And then she said, I'm gonna call you back in a week with some, some quotes and see what you think. And so she told me everything and I said, you know, you realize I run a business out of my home. This isn't some, you know, mall store, you know, some store in a shopping mall. She goes, that's no problem, that's fine. I was like, all right, so that's what we did. We uh, went through it and she found me a really good rate, and I, I double-checked it online before I committed, and then I signed the contract, and I have a great rate locked in for another duration. You know, it's probably about another year and three months or so, which makes me really happy. But yeah, uh, the old days, electricity was a lot more expensive here, and you know, eventually, who knows, things might go up. I mean, prices are changing because of the, the laws that keep changing in the country. And a lot of people are talking about tariffs right now, and you know, that's a big topic of discussion. And it's going to affect the price of products that are coming into the U.S., and it's going to affect the price of products that customers are buying. And it's funny, uh, as I was thinking about the power topic and the, the cost of electricity, and I was thinking, you know, my, my electricity just really doesn't cost much. You know, I just don't have to worry about it, and so I don't care. You know, I just pay the bill. Um, but if my electricity was crazy high, like in California, and every watt mattered, maybe my attitude about buying equipment would be completely different. For example, if my electric bill was $400 every month, I might not want to buy a Radeon light fixture. I might not want to buy a, a Vortec pump because those are considered high-end expensive items. And I might actually lean into the JBO uh, category of equipment. But then again, I want equipment that uses less power. So sometimes you have to buy high-end anyway to get the better efficiency. So I don't know, I, it's just something crossed my mind. You know, it was one of those little moments when you're kind of like reflecting on things. And why is it that not everyone gets a Vortec? Why doesn't everyone just get the Radeon? <laughs> so that's why I was thinking, I wonder if maybe my, if my bills are so freaking high that I would be cheaper on equipment. I, I don't know, probably not. I, I tend to like the nicer things. You know, I can't always afford the nicer things, but I sure like them. And you know, I can drool and want them. Matter of fact, the TV that hangs in my house uh, was on the wall at Sam's for a good 18 months where I'd go visit it. <laughs> it was so pretty. It was a beautiful Sony plasma, and I wanted it so badly, and it was so expensive when it first came out. 
and 18 months later it was taken down from the wall and it was on a clearance you know cart and i bought that thing and i have it to this day <laughs> and i know there's more efficient tvs out there now and probably even better quality you know the 4k but uh yeah that was the one i really wanted and i waited a long time to get it that's just how i'm wired <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see, I see questions. Oh. Someone's comparing their lighting. Gotcha, all right. Um, are there any other questions for me that I can answer you guys today? We're only 30 minutes in. What other news do I have for you? Let me... Uh, check and see how my tank is doing because I just had a recent uh, water test done by the Trident so hey that's pretty cool my Trident <coughs> has I've been trying to get it since last week to control the calcium reactor and basically what I want to do is trigger <coughs> a virtual switch that will slow down the amount of CO2 going into the calcium reactor based on the fact that my alkalinity has, rich, has risen above my set level. So I'm really wanting 9.3 for some reason. And so I did all the code with Dwayne's help. You know, we went back over it, we reviewed it, we checked it, we analyzed it, we, we went to the web to see if we had the command correct. We did everything. And my alkalinity just kept going up, 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 up. I mean, it just constantly was driving upward. It was trending. I, I couldn't understand it. And neither could he. <laughs> And he looked at his own code. He looked at Richard Ross's code, who's a friend of mine in California. And all our code matches, but my reactor keeps going up. So I decided to do the weirdest thing ever, and I made the code backwards. I reversed the numbers that physically should not work. And now my numbers are trending down. So who knows? Maybe I'm onto something. But it is funny. I'm not really sure. Um... Jose, I don't know where I got that, this shirt. Uh, I'm looking at it. I have a feeling that this was a shirt that I got for Jesse's wedding. I flew to Fiji when she got married a couple years ago, and I, and I was part of the wedding party, so I had to blend in. And uh, so I was the only bridesmaid, <laughs> which is hilarious. And I'm totally fine with that because you know, she's my best friend. So uh, I had to have something that matched the color of all the dresses. There you go. Uh, someone asked me, have you ever been diving in Roatan? I have not. Um, that is not a destination I've been to yet. I'm toying with the thought of different places right now, you know, but I, I really want to hold off. I've been traveling a lot. I need some downtime. I need some stay here and work and take care of things for customers and get things edited for YouTube. I saw someone just recently commented saying, you know, I get the live streams are easier for you, and uh, but I really miss the edited content, and I agree. And I, I just need the time to sit and edit. And I'm actually here for a, a good month, which is great. I have nothing on the books right now, which gives me some time to just really sit and edit and hopefully create some nice videos for you guys that you'll you'll enjoy. And uh, there's some of these things are so old, I'm not even sure how to share them with you other than to say, here's an old video. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, maybe... One person said, just release them on Thursday because that's Throwback Thursday. I was like, yeah, it's brilliant. I could release 50 of them then. <laughs> but no, I've never been to Roatan. I would love to do that at some point. I, I like to pick nice destinations. I don't want to just be in the water just to be in the water. I want to be there because there's a reason. And like, for example, some of my friends just recently were diving in Egypt in the uh, Red Sea or the Dead Sea. Probably saying that wrong. But the views were fantastic and i was like man i just wish i was down there with my iphone with my lighting to see what they really look like because their pictures didn't look like i would expect so i was like i wish i could take those pictures myself all right um glenn smith says i've got a small patch of red algae with bubbles over it i sucked it out but it's back is there a product i can use to remove it permanently thanks the red algae could have been a patch of cyanobacteria and it does return if it's not completely eradicated siphoning it out is a great simple solution it's instantaneous but if the bacteria is in the blooming state where it shows up then you may need to actually treat the tank with something like red cyano rx 
Uh, another brand is called ChemiClean. Both of those work really well. I've used them many, many times. And uh, it works in a matter of like three days flat and just gets rid of it. And it's great to use it in your tank when your tank has only a little bit. You know, when it's just starting, just nip it in the bud and get rid of it and move on with your life. And you'll avoid a lot of the, the frustration, I would say, of having to deal with a lot of a mess, you know, a, a big mess. You know, the, the more infested the situation is, the more dense the bacteria is, the more that is going to have to be siphoned out. It's going to die off. Uh, your skimmer is going to go bonkers. <laughs> so if you can catch it early, you kind of it, it should be a lot smooth sailing, a lot smoother for you in trying to get that resolved. Uh, Fun with Reefing says I'll be in Dallas for three days, but I have to work nonstop. Well, if you find some free time, uh, you're welcome to come see the reef. So there you go. I gave you a public invitation in front of everyone. And I'm, I'm in Fort Worth. So that's west of Dallas, 45 minutes. Uh, so says something interesting. I'm going to stick it on the broadcast. Switching to DC power uh, equipment can save a lot of electricity in, con in uh, comparison to AC. And that is actually something that I'm not 100% sure is true. Because I had a friend who was doing a fish... Um, his basement was just filled with aquariums. He was breeding fish. He had tons and tons of tanks, and he had tons of lights. And every one of those lights had a DC power plug. <laughs> and somehow his electric bill went ballistic. I just went so high up. And he was calling the power company. He was like, what is going on? I'm using only LEDs. There's no chance I'm using this much power. And apparently there was this cumulative effect of a lot of those black bricks being converting power from 110 to, to, to DC power. There was a lot of power. I don't know. I would just like I said. I don't know for a fact on that one. But logically, you would think DC would be better, and uh, some things should be replaced that way if you can. I know there's a lot of love these days for the DC powered return pumps versus AC, and uh, and you can actually adjust the flow rate. You can turn up the the strength of the pump to a faster gallon per hour, or you can slow it down again. So that kind of a, that's kind of a nice choice, especially if you're worried your plumbing can't keep up, you can turn the pump down. So that's kind of convenient. You can dial it in to get it nice and quiet. Uh, let me double check there's not a question I've missed. I switched windows here. Uh, Adam says, can I add calcium and magnesium to my ATO? I don't have a doser. Well, good news, I sell dosers. <laughs> Uh, if you go to my website, the Camor pumps are individual dosers, and each one is $60. They're not expensive. Super easy to set up. You use your phone to program it. And uh, let's see. Why not show you the screen of the app? That'd be nice, right? So this is the Camor. Switches to here. And in this, uh, this first one here, it says Nopox. I named it that way. And then inside of it, I have my programming. Let's see, where is it? Oh, maybe it's settings. I only use this thing when I absolutely have to. So, nope. Where is it? I thought plan ad was with. Here we go. It didn't show up the first time. Weird. So, when you fill up your, when you set up your doser, you tell it how much liquid is in the dosing container. So, I told it a 1,000 milliliters or one liter. And I told it I want 40 milliliters per day broken out over the schedule. And you can see that at five minutes after midnight, it doses 10 milliliters. And then at 6.05 a.m., it does another 10. And then at 12.05 p.m., another 10. And then finally at 6.05 p.m., uh, the final 10. And so that's how it's been dosing Nopox. And you can have this list of multiple dosing pumps right here. And you can have each one dose what you need. So I would recommend using a dosing pump if you can. But if you absolutely cannot, then you can manually dose by hand. Just pour it in. So if you don't have a dosing pump and you don't have money for a dosing pump, then you can actually figure out what you need to add, put in a little tiny cup, and pour it into your tank in an area of very high flow. You want to mix up really quickly as it hits the water. You don't want to see a cloud of magnesium just dump in and drizzle and turn into snowflakes. You want it to mix up. And so, no, I wouldn't put your, alkalinity, your calcium or your magnesium in the top-off water. I would dose it directly to the tank where it belongs. You don't need all kinds of precipitants happening in your ATO reservoir. Uh, did you miss the video of Bonaire? Is it on Facebook? No and no. You have not missed it. I haven't done it yet. 
One person just asked, do you ship to New Zealand? Uh, depends what you're asking for. But yeah, I, I ship to a lot of the countries. Uh, I've chosen to just do that, go the extra mile. I basically have to find out your address, go to the post office, get a quote, <laughs> and then we box it up and it gets mailed to you, um, international. And you get it usually, I don't know, within 10 days or so. And it depends on customs on the other side. How long does that take? Uh, did you get your nitrate down? Uh, the last time I checked it was right at a week ago. And, you know, it's time. Today's water test Saturday. And the nitrate seemed to measure at 15. So you would think in theory this week I would be down even lower. That's what I'm hoping. And I need to find out. So, because I really want to be down around 10, and then I want to lower the dose of the amount of nopox being added, because I'm still getting the slime stuff inside my tank. And it's just a white bacteria is what it is. And it becomes coagulated, and you'll see it like dangling in the, in the sump off the power cables, or you'll see it inside the propeller of the Vortec, or you'll see it kind of wafting around in the overflow box, because mine's clear and I can see through it. So. It's important to you know use what you need. Don't kill your tank, obviously. I, matter of fact, I never used the full strength. It recommended for my total water system um, 64 milliliters per day, and I just did 40 from the beginning. And even then, I've still had this weird snot stuff I've had to deal with, and there's a couple little spots in my tank where I have to scoop it off myself. And I've had to wipe down inside my sump a couple of times and clean off sensors for my top off so that it keeps operating properly. So there's some extra maintenance from using this product. But yeah, getting the nitrate down was the goal and I wanted to see if it would work and it, it seems to be doing what it's supposed to do. It's just kind of a, a messy solution. And I've had a lot of people say, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you try vodka? Why didn't you do big water changes? Why didn't, you know, everyone's got, I mean, yeah, I know there's other ways of doing it. I wanted to try Notebox because I'd never used it before in my life and I wanted to see what it could do. So I guess I could have just only used it in my frag tank and that way I test in a small area, but I wanted to see what my reef would do. So I was curious and, you know, and cautious at the same time. I wanted to make sure I was doing everything right and I was talking to people that have used it themselves. Um, what do you think about Acropower? Uh, you know, it's a amino acid provided by two little fishies and I've got friends that swear by it. Dwayne won't run a tank without it. And, I, and uh, Brad, whose tank you're going to see as well in the near future, both of them use Acropower daily. I've never used it, even though I actually have a gallon of it here. That um, I just, It's one of those things where even the owner of the company said it's 50-50. 50% of the people say they love it, it's amazing, and 50% will say they can't tell the difference. So the only way for me to know for a fact would be for me to just literally dose it every single day for a month or two and see if I could see any kind of grand change in my reef based on what my reef normally does. The only uh, downturn in my reef lately has been some of my hammer corals are dying. And it's not the entire colony. It's kind of the, the funny part is it's the top. It's, you know, the colony is this big, huge wall of hammers and the very top has a bunch of missing heads where there's white. And I, I know I cleaned the Vortec recently, so there could have been more flow. It really just irritated them. But I'm almost wondering if it's my fish. And what I think is happening is when I pour the food into the tank to feed the reef, I think the food goes everywhere, including into the hammer. And I think the fish are hitting the coral left and right, trying to get all the scraps of food. And I think they're the ones <laughs> killing my hammer colony. So I don't know. But I'm just going to kind of keep an eye on things and... I might have to move that Vortec a little bit or turn it down a little bit. I'm not sure what, what to do there. Um, Steve P says, my leather coral bleached while adding bio pellets. It's been bad for six weeks now. Leather corals are susceptible to aluminum. Uh, bio pellets don't have aluminum in them, but if there's anything with aluminum in your tank, and that actually is a there's, a, there's a product called Nitrate Sponge by Kent that is aluminum based. That really affects leathers badly. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what happened with your coral or if the bio pellets are the actual reason. Maybe they're stripping the water of too much stuff really quickly. Um, you also need to be adding something like Microbacter 7 to your tank once a week with bio pellets. So perhaps the leather is lacking something it was getting before. 
It's too bad it's bleaching. Is it under a lot of light? Can you move it down out of the light somewhat to give it a kind of a break or turn the lights off a few hours earlier each day so it's not getting hammered away and kind of heal? I would check into that. And if if all else fails, stop running a bio pellet. Um, you know, if you if you add something to your tank and it's causing problems and more problems than it's solving, then I would walk away from it. And you know, you've heard from me when I said I tried one thing and it didn't work and when I removed it my tank did better. You know, we all have to find what works best for our aquarium. Is there a product used to, uh, Robert, is there a product you can use to reduce magnesium? No, <laughs> I don't know of anything that reduces magnesium. The simplest solution typically is to uh, use lower, uh, a saltwater mix that has a lower magnesium volume to it. So if you're, and I'll tell you, my reef, uh, when I first set up my 400 gallon in 2011, the salt that I was using back then, every bag of salt was uh, 1500 or 1600 ppm magnesium. So for three years, my tank was just very high with magnesium all the time, and I couldn't do anything to bring it down, and I never had to dose it. <laughs> so it, it's not going to destroy your tank. It is hard on snails. Snails don't move well when the magnesium level is too high. But normally, if you want to get magnesium to come down, you're going to want to use salt water that measures at 1200 or 1300. So it's coming, you know, each time you take some water out, you're putting in a less concentrated amount, and that should help reduce it. The other choice, of course, would be to grow lots of Montipora, because Montipora loves magnesium. But you'll need those colonies to grow big and just act like sponges and soak it up. And that would be my advice. Um, Adrian says, where did you get the magnetic stirrer? Uh, I got it from a guy in China, and he sent it to me as a gift. And at the time, I was blown away by it. I love it. I, use, I still use it to this day. It's awesome. And he had 3D printed it with a bunch of little electronic parts put inside and uses a battery. And in the meantime, there are other companies that offer it. And I believe the magnetic stirrer video has a link to the actual item you can buy from Amazon or somewhere. If you'll look, maybe it's in the comments. Um, and you can find a version that's quite similar to the one I have. And a few of my friends have been buying that, that one and they were really happy. So uh, that's what I would recommend. But he uh, decided to go a different route with something that makes a lot more money. And uh, he, didn't, and he never went to the point of selling those. So there you are. Um, Fun with Reefing says, I'm not sure if this is going to help, but my nitrate was above 12. Ah, underachiever. And I vacuumed the sand bed and pulled out a lot of detritus. It's a 300 gallon tank, and I did this twice in two sections. Yeah, that's not a bad advice. And you know, Dwayne's been telling me that he wants me to go in my tank and attack my sand bed too, and I really don't want to. He's even suggested something simpler rather than vacuuming. He was recommending a turkey baster and actually pumping the turkey baster to puff up the crap in the sand bed that's near the surface and get the skimmer and the filter socks to pull that out. And he keeps saying, when are you going to do the turkey baster thing? And I'm just like, yeah, right. It's not going to happen. Uh, H2O asks, what about adding phytoplankton? Does it have positive or no effect on a reef? Oh, it actually has a good effect. And uh, there are things that take up phytoplankton. Copepods and all the little bugs you like, they definitely consume it. Some corals will eat it, but the shell, the membrane of the algae cell itself is so hard that sometimes they will just export the same phyto they ate. So they ate like a lemon drop and then a lemon drop came out, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. So there are certain creatures that can definitely absorb it and use it. And there are others that pass it. And then there are others that don't use it at all. But it can benefit. And one of the things that uh, we learned years ago was when you dosed phytoplankton to your tank on a regular basis, and not just like dump in some random amount, but you were kind of metering it in and you were dialing it into the right amount for your tank, they found that their algae on the glass grew less. It was, uh, it was nice, the glass stayed clean longer, which is a nice convenience. So there's nothing wrong with that part. And nowadays we can get phytoplankton really condensed. You know, it, it's, it's so pure that you can just put a very small amount into your tank and you can get these commercial bottles like Reef Nutrition makes. And their Phyto Feast is one example, and you put in whatever the designated amount is for your tank, and you don't have to worry about making your own. But uh, I, I used to grow my own phytoplankton in a two-gallon container, and I had that thing just bubbling away 24 hours a day for, I don't know, years. 
And I got so many emails from people asking me, can I drink it? <laughs> and I'm just like, no, you cannot drink the phytoplankton. Phytoplankton's for your reef tank. And they say, like, I don't have a reef tank. I read on some nutrition website that phytoplankton's a good part of the human diet. And I was like, I have no idea. Do not do that. So, you know, I can't tell people to take aquarium stuff and start eating it. That's crazy. What are we going to do next? Tell people to lick zoanthids? <laughs> Terrible idea. Um, Dan says, my lobo, brain coral, has one side that is curled up and showing the underside and has a hole in it. Well, Dan, uh, could be too much flow. Could be, uh, by the way, I like your little, uh, your little uh, avatar. That's cute. I don't know what it represents, but I like, I mean, obviously I like, I know, I know Donald Duck, but uh, the fact that the coral is curled up could be a water parameter change. It could be the way the flow is hitting it. It could be the, um, something is nipping at it or something is trying to make a home under it and they're kind of chipping away at your coral and irritating it. So you might want to look into that and see if there's something going on. Now this coral that you have, is it on top of a rock where it's not sitting down in the sand or it's being irritated by the sand bed? You know, these are all the kind of things that we have to kind of ask to help you out. Um, and then here, uh, Slackjaw says, I, I know you mentioned building a different sump as to why and how it's involved. And so the effort involved in swapping out a sump is not to be underrated it is a lot of work so you've got to remove the existing sump which means you got to drain it to the bottom and you got to pull the darn thing out and there's a lot of plumbing connected which you got to disconnect all the plumbing to then you get it out and then you can put in the new one and you got to replumb anything that has to be replumbed you know just to make it all work together and i've had the same sump under my tank for nine years i built the sump in 2010 and since then, I make much nicer things. And I was like, I really want to make a nicer one for myself for once. And, you know, just replace it. And so I thought, I'm going to replace it. I'm going to make it where it has a spot for my trident to fit on there officially. It's going to have a little shelf that's wider just to sit there. I'd like to put a spot where if I want to run a sock, it the plumbing works correctly for that need. I want to have the option to run the clerisy if I don't want to do a sock and I want to use a fleece roller. So I want to be able to choose between those two items. I want to increase the size of the refugium to make it bigger. And I'm actually thinking about the, uh, when I look at my reef from the front and I look at my refugium underneath, you know, my refugium is the full width. And I'm, my plan with the, sump, the new sump is to have the refugium a little bit less long so that I can see a little tiny bit of the return zone. So when you're looking from the front of the tank, you can see the water line of the return zone. And if it's dropping down, because it's not getting top off water, I would be able to see that immediately from across the room, where right now I have to walk all the way around the fish, into the fish room and look down to notice if there's a problem. And I've been caught off guard a couple of times and it's annoying. So I decided I want to do it where I can see a little bit of the return zone from the front. I even toyed with the thought of putting the skimmer in the front and the return zone in the front and put the refugium on the fish room side. Thought about reversing it just for fun, um, but I don't think that's a good idea. And the only benefit of switching it that way would be I can get the collection cup off the skimmer, go straight to the kitchen to wash it, where right now I have to go into the fish room to disconnect it. And then, but I, that has, the fish room has uh, concrete floors, so I can drip on there and not worry, where my living room has carpet. So uh, yeah, so I've got some ideas, some things I wanna do differently. I wanna change how the plumbing goes into the sump. Uh, most sumps, you always go straight down in. And my goal with a new sump is to go in the side. And because my overflow box is at the end, it's external, the drains come straight down and I want them to come straight down and go right into the end of the sump and then the sump can travels across. So these are some of the things I wanna do. So I'm looking to make something nicer, more efficient, uh, better, and, uh, and make some fun changes. So that's why I'm doing this craziness, even though technically I don't actually, must, I don't need to change it. I just wanna. Ah, thank you, Dan. Uh, I did not know that was a U of O mascot. Cool. Very cool. I didn't realize they could do that. Yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, Disney owns Donald Duck. <laughs> How do you get permission to use their duck? But yeah, all right. Um, yeah, Dan, I would, 
maybe put a flat rock under the core to lift it up. I would inspect it, maybe look if anything needs to be, could it be dipped and see if there's something on there that's irritating it? Or is there something nearby that's sending out a sweeper at night? Check on your tank at night, that's a good one. I just realized that one. Check on your tank at night, get a flashlight, and just kind of walk around the entire tank and look at all sides and see if anything interesting is going on. Because I used to discover all kinds of neat things after the lights are out. That's when the invertebrates all come to life, and that's when all the worms and the crabs and the snails are all out and about. And you might catch someone in the act, and they may be irritating that lobo you were worried about. Yeah. Chip says, my sump swap took eight hours. I never thought it would take that long. And you're right. Yeah, I know. It takes, it takes a lot of time. It's always going to be longer than you expect. And so what I, I do is I allocate an entire day to the project. And the other thing is you've got to figure out where to put all that water and all the macroalgae and the sand and whatever else that's in your current sump, that all has to be moved into something. You're going to also want new salt water that's clean because a lot of that stuff's going to be mucked up and dirty. And uh, yeah, the whole setup process, it's, it's twice the work. You're removing and putting in all at the same time in the same spot. So plan on it being all day. If you had someone to help you, that would be great. Oh my God, what? Sebeckis is saying that he used honey to reduce nitrate and phosphate. That is amazing. Well, I love honey. I don't know if I'd share it with my tank, but it makes sense because one of the, the dosing options that we have, we say vinegar and we say vodka, and we also say sugar, and honey is a sugar. How much honey are you using per what? Like, is it so many milliliters or grams per 100 gallons or liters? I mean, yeah, obviously you're from Belgium. So what is your ratio? I'm very curious how you came across that and how that worked. That's really neat. Honey, never would have thought of that one. And then David says, I'm thinking about changing salt brands. I want to go to a different brand. How do I do it? You know, a big water change, gradual water changes. To be honest, it'd probably be best to just do smaller water changes uh, rather than just dumping in a, fr a brand new flavor into your reef. That could cause a little bit more chaos doing a big jump. So you could, do smaller water changes, and you could even do them a little bit more frequently to transition your tank. But the number one rule of a water change is to make sure that you match temperature, pH, and salinity. And if you get those three correct, if they're the same, you know, in your barrel as well as in your tank, you can do all the water changes you want. But when it comes to changing salt brands, you may see a reaction. So it's probably better to be gradual so that your livestock can adapt to it rather than being shocked by it. Uh, a teaspoon per day of honey to what size aquarium is what I'd like to know, Saveki. Um, Nick asks an interesting question. I like to be able to move the rocks around to improve aesthetics occasionally. But because of this, I'm not sure if I should mount my corals securely. Should I commit to one design and mount them? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I would plan on going with an aquascape you love and plant your corals where they go because corals that are physically attached and are not moving in the flow tend to grow better than ones that are rocking. When, when the coral itself is twitching, uh, the coral doesn't move, as, it doesn't grow as quickly. So I would definitely get it secure. And if you do have to make a change and you have to pull things out, you can always break them free. The, the putties that we use, the glues, they're not forever. They, they're good at holding it, but they are also removable. So if you have to make a change, you can secure everything again and replant your corals in the orientation you need. And that even happens with corals that get big, too big and they're too close to each other. We have to like pull one off and move it over and replant it. So yeah, I would do that. But I don't change my rock structure very often. Uh, matter of fact, I kind of commit to something forever. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned in my presentation with Dwayne, we did an aquascaping presentation a few times together. And one of the things that we came across when we tore out all that coral out of my tank was that the aquascape itself, Dwayne says it's great, there's nothing to change. We just need to put new stuff on top. And that's what we did. We didn't move one rock to a new spot. We kept everything the way it was because the layout I'd, I'd chosen got his seal of approval, which is pretty nice. Because that guy's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, fun with reefing. One teaspoon of honey per cup of tea. Yeah, 500 liters. Let me see, let's see something here really quick. I can 
convert liters to gallons because I need to know. So 132 gallons, you're doing a teaspoon a day. Hmm, interesting. All right, well, thanks for letting me know that. I really appreciate that. Tristan says, would you ever go all LED on your tank? <sighs> Believe it or not, I was just thinking to myself a few days ago, maybe I would jump to a new choice, but I really love my metal halides. <laughs> And I've got a lot of money invested in them. I mean, literally, I have extra bulbs and extra ballasts, so I'm always prepared for if there's a problem. And that way I can swap one out immediately if, there, if one goes down. So I don't need it for a while. But I was kind of toying with the thought of maybe, like, let's say, for example, let's say Ecotech came out with a new Radeon. And it's like the best of the best. kind of like the idea of jumping to that, you know? But do I need to? No. Is my reef growing well? Yes. So do I need to mess with it? No. So, and again, is it really going to make that much of a difference? I, and I didn't do the math yet on the wattage I'm using for the tank, but I know it's 1,200 watts, and it's about seven hours a day for 1,200 watts. So you do that for the kilowatt hours for 30 days, and you get the math, and it might be making my electric bill 20 bucks more than uh, if I didn't have them on. You know, it's not a huge amount of power. I'm not paying $100 a month in metal halides. <laughs> so that's why I have no real desire to switch it. I don't, there, I don't have, matter of fact, I was talking with um, someone, oh, talking with Brad, because I was at his house in Utah. And he had switched from his metal halides to uh, these new lights, I, I forget the brand, I'll have to ask him what they were called. But he was really happy with them. I said, what do you think? You know, what do you, and because first he had one strip of lights going across the top of his reef. And then he put two of these LED lights that he had shooting down into the tank. I said, well, why'd you go with two? And he said, because everyone told me one wasn't enough. So I got two. I said, all right. And how do you feel after everything's said and done? You know, what about how did it affect the room you're in? Is the room less hot? And he says, oh, yeah. He says, it's a lot better now. It doesn't get nearly as hot. And his reef is actually in his basement. And his basement is... You know, it's like a level of the home. It doesn't feel like you're down in the basement, if that makes sense. But no, it's like a nice living area, and there's the reef tank, and there's computers, and this fireplace, and you know, the television, and it's just, it's where everyone goes to hang out. Matter of fact, I've never seen the rest of his house, because we always go straight down to that level of the house. But anyway, he said, but since I installed them, my heaters are running all the time to heat the tank. So watts for watts, are you really gonna save any electricity? If I have to give up 1200 watts of light, and let's say the Radeon ends up pulling, let's say I need three lights or four or six, I don't know. And I end up using 800 watts instead of 1200 watts. That's great. But now are my heaters going to run longer? Am I going to be running 1000 watts of heat in my sump for half the day to make up for the lack of heat being dumped in the tank from the metal halides? So you see, you can't really outwit physics. And so in that regard, there's not really a real need for me to switch. It would be more like a want or a desire, the, the ability to change the colors of the tank on a whim. It's like, oh, I want to take pictures. Let me change it all to 10K. Click. That'd be nice. And then, you know, like, okay, I want to go back to 20K because it's pretty. Or I want to try this, you know? I mean, yeah, you can dial things in instantly. But even then, even though a lot of you have the ability to change the color on your tank, how many of you actually change the color before you take that picture that you share to the web? Because I see a lot of pictures of people's tanks where they're asking for help, and all I see is a big blue blur. And because they didn't take the picture under white light, they didn't use the flash, they just, you know, they, their eye can see it, so they think their camera can, which they know it didn't. They're looking at the screen on their phone, and it's garbage, and they still upload it. Like, what is this thing? I'm like, it's blue. So with the ability to control LEDs, we should be actually using that ability to change the color spectrum so we can actually take pictures of things and share with others and impress our friends and ask for help. You know, that's how it should be. All righty. Um, let's see what else we got going on. Oh, I bet I missed some questions here. <laughs> Reef Chase is saying it's sacrilege for me to talk about switching from my metal halides. I actually do love the ones I have. So, and Nick, uh, when it comes to the Aquascape, the, the find the one that you love, it's going to come down to your, your preference, your desire of what looks good. Uh, you might get some opinion from a few more people and then basically commit. 
and don't mess with it anymore. That would be my, my advice. That way you can enjoy the tank. You're not constantly messing with it. All right. So I wanted to tell you guys about Reef Trace. It is an app that I am a partner in, and it is for Android and for iOS. And it allows you to measure and uh, keep track of your water parameters. So let me pull it up on my phone real quick. <clears throat> So this is Reef Trace, and here are my readings from last week, all down here. And there's a graph here at the top of the screen that allows, you know, that shows the stuff. And if you change your comparisons, for example, to let's go to the earlier part of the year, for example, and then we hit update, then we'll see more of the trending of each of these parameters. And the thing is, you can actually select what you want to see. So you can say, I only want to see what my phosphate was. So you would turn off these other things that are on, and then you'll just get a graph for that one item. So there we go, and it shows how the phosphates went from 0.1 all the way down. You know, It just bounces around based on whatever I'm doing with my tank, how much I'm feeding, and so forth. And I believe one of the reasons my phosphate has got lower and lower is because of my dosing NOPOX, which totally makes sense. There's a new feature they added a couple of months ago, which I really like. It's called Quick Log. And it lets me put in all my favorite ones that I use all the time. These are the ones I always want to fill in. So I would instantly add my alkalinity, my calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, salinity, temperature, pH. And I would hit save, and it would put the date, and boom, they'd all be added, which is super nice. And you can see up here are other choices of what you could be putting in there. You can also set them up as favorites. So with your parameters, everything with a heart next to it is the ones I care about. And then all the other ones don't have hearts or ones I really am not measuring for, so it's not on my list. But I can always drop it and say, oh, I want to also include TDS now. So I put a heart next to it, and now you'll see TDS is in the list right there. And I could add a TDS entry. And I can just hit plus, and I could log the entry, and I could put in the item. So that is one part of the app that's very useful. Built into the app, of course, is also Critter ID, which is part of my website, which lets you look up all the different creatures that are on the site if you were trying to just determine what was in your aquarium. So you went to the pest section, and then, oh, <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> Great example. All right, let's see, try that one more time. Could it have been my internet was down? Or did I find a glitch? There we go. So then here are different pests that are known pests in our aquariums that we might want to deal with or eradicate. And you would pick the one and learn more about it by touching it. And something that I use all the time as a hobbyist is the LFS locator, which I love. And you can zoom in and see what's near you, or you can zoom out and see what's further away. And so all of these markers are different fish stores in the Metroplex. And then if you want, you can actually take your cursor and you can move it to a different spot and say, is there anything down here in this area? And it'll help identify whatever's within a 45 mile radius. So we can see, there we just found one there in Waco. So it's kind of convenient that way. So let me go back up here to Fort Worth. Let me drag this back. And one of the new features that they've added is the ability to write a review. So I wrote a review today. And not only will you be able to put reviews about stores to let other people know if you like the store or not, you also have the ability to report an LFS to show at the very top of the screen, it says place is permanently closed or doesn't exist. So we can update the app and make sure people don't try to go to a place that no longer exists. So it'll allow you to interact with the store in that regard so we can keep things up to date. So of course, if you run a fish store, let us know so we can add you to this app. Every single fish store that's in the app is there because we called the store and they answered and they verified that they are in business. And we also want to make sure they're a real store and it wasn't like you're going to some guy's house. So we wanted to verify that. But if you... Um, see a, a mistake you know you can always let us know or you can use the report button so that way we can let we can get this updated as quickly as possible and then you can do a search for certain things that are near you so like fish paradise is down the street from me but then here are all the other paradise stores across the nation in different states so you can actually look things up from the closest further away super convenient nice app it's 399 and uh, those are just a few of the features there's more in here you can track multiple aquariums, so I've got three in mine. And uh, there's also your notes where you can keep track of everything. 
and you can add things under feedings, installs, replacing things, replenishing things, and you can add a picture of the thing you're working on. So it kind of reminds you what you did. When did you use something? And it's a nice way to keep track of things all in one app. So I do recommend that. All right. Uh, Linda's Reef says, wouldn't you save power on air conditioning if you didn't have the metal halides? Um, probably not. I mean, yes, I do agree that the heat from the lights adds heat to the house and the AC has to fight it. But the, what really adds heat to my house is my dehumidifier, which is plugged in, pulling the moisture out of the, out of the air. And the heat pumping off that thing makes this room I'm in right now quite warm, where the bedrooms are going to be much cooler in comparison because they're further away from the aquarium and from the dehumidifier. So I would have to somehow vent the dehumidifier into my attic to remove that heat. And uh, then the AC unit would work less hard. But uh, I have a central system. I'm not using like a window unit to cool just one spot. And I'm running a full house AC system. And then I have a roll around AC for my workshop. And you know my bill last month was like less than $200 for running a business out of my home, running a 400 gallon reef tank with a frag system and an anemone cube. And uh, the workshop with all the huge power tools and minion that runs in there as well. So that kind of answers those points. Let's see. I think we should throw something on the screen. I found something fun to stick on here. How about that? We have less than 19 minutes of time left before we're done. I <laughs> found a feature. I found some interesting stuff. I tried to learn a little bit more how to use the software. And that way I could share things with you guys a little bit more professionally. Like I always feel like you know, it just comes across semi-cheesy. And I'd like it to be better. But if you have more questions, please ask. Now's your chance. And uh, I'll, while I'm waiting for your questions, I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, it is water test Saturday. Please do test your water parameters. And let's uh, get all the data compiled so you know what your tank needs this week. I also want you to clean your protein skimmers and the neck of the skimmer, the riser section of the skimmer, so it's nice and clean and efficient. I actually cleaned mine two days ago right before I left town, so that way there was no weird surprises while I was traveling. But we want to know how our alkalinity is doing, our calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate, salinity, temperature. These are all things that matter. And it's very important that you keep on top of these numbers so that your livestock will thrive and not just survive. Discus Keeper, ZA. I wonder what ZA stands for. I, uh, I appreciate that you, you tuned in for the live stream. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, <laughs> Lamo UFO says, fish stores, you mean online stores with Google? You know, it is, no, um, okay, so a couple things. I just saw a bunch of conversation here that I didn't see on my screen before. The uh, LFS locator ideally is going to be global. It's not just for the US only. It's supposed to be all over the world. And uh, obviously, we only can put in the data that we have that we're able to verify. So anything you can give to us that we can add to our database, we're happy to add because we want it to be comprehensive, we want it to be accurate. And one of the things, I, I was going through it and I noticed they didn't have hours of operation, so I asked them to add that as well, so that way you'd know when a store is open. But the ability, once you find the store on the map, you can click a link and it'll take you to their website, it takes you, it can let you make a phone call to them, or you can click the icon to actually go straight to your Maps app of your phone and get you to that location just by letting the, you know, the built-in uh, navigation take you there. So there's some nice features in using that app, but I always like to fill things in to have more details. I'd like to see a picture of the front of the store when you're looking at the, uh, the little LFS marker, um, or, or their store logo would be nice. But I mean, everything takes work, and nothing happens easily. <laughs> and when you call up a fish store out of the blue and say, hey, we're working on this app, click. It's like, we haven't even told you what we're doing. They're just like, oh, it's a sales call. And a lot of stores refused to take phone calls in the beginning when we were just trying to verify they were open for business and that they had, you know, that they were at this address. You know, it was a simple thing. And it's funny. I mean, people are funny. Okay. Um, Discus Keeper says, my SPS is slowly dying. They turn white over a period of a month. And here's the weird part. It happens one coral at a time. 
Oh, South Africa. All right. Um, it could be temperature that your tank is getting too hot and you're gradually cooking your corals. And having one coral go up in smoke and then another coral go up in smoke, that's not unheard of. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a system-wide turning of everything turning to white. You can just have things dying left and right. And it could be from a number of things, from some kind of parameter shift that is not being kept stable. It could be temperature swings. It could be pests that are chewing on certain corals and just working their way systematically from one to the next. It could even be a fish-related thing where it's nipping at it. So you're going to have to actually really research your tank, really study it closely, and, and see if you can figure out what's happening. You might have to take the temperature of that tank multiple times a day. Check it at 10 a.m., 2 a.m. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was going to say that. Uh, 10 a.m. and then 2 p.m. and then 6 p.m. and then 9 p.m. and then 2 a.m. What's it? Is your tank crazy cold at night? And then you're warming it up all day. I mean, these are the things you got to know because you're... And there are people out there that have their aquariums dialed in so tightly that the temperature variance is like half a degree for the entire day, where my tank tends to vary about 2 degrees per day. 78 to 80, 79 to 81, it's somewhere in there. And uh, that's been my ratio of uh, temperature swings for a very long time. I actually raised the temperature of my tank a degree um, last winter, I believe, so that it wouldn't get down so low. Like it was getting down to, uh, I think it was 76.9, which is just under 77. And I thought, why am I letting it down since it goes up anyway to 79? I'm going to keep it at 78 to 79. And so, of course, now the tank's at 78 and it goes to 80 because it's in the summer months now. So, um, What phosphate level is the best for a mixed reef tank? I would say the general rule is 0 0.03. Oh, that was another thing that I didn't show you guys. I'll and some people don't know what's in there, so I want to show it to you. Inside the same app, it actually shows you the recommended amounts. So we'll go back to here. And then when you go here and you hit um, statistics, no, parameters. No, nope, statistics. Nope, still saying it wrong. Where is it? I just saw it. I lost it. Weird. Oh, here it is, parameter guide. If you click parameter guide, it shows the parameters of natural seawater. These are the numbers that I recommend. And then these are the averages of all the users of Reef Trace and what their numbers are coming back. And as you can see, all you guys have no nitrate, which is amazing. <laughs> and your phosphate's crazy low. And I know a lot of people have super low nitrate and phosphate, and even zero all the time, and they're dealing with weird algae problems because your tank needs a little bit of nitrate and phosphate. So if you look under my recommendation here in the middle, I'm saying that you should have your nitrate around two, you can have it around five, something under 10, that would be smart. But uh, you know, zero is not great, and we recommend that you have a little bit more in your water. And phosphate, 0 0.03 is the standard. That's what we usually tell everyone to go for. And if you're a little bit higher, like 0.1, that's fine. If you're at 0.5 or 1.0 or more, it's way too much. So we definitely do want to have the, uh, the correct amount in your tank so that the corals can uptake, uptake what they need, but not be so much that it's growing algae left and right. And as you guys have seen my tank, you know, you get to see close-ups, you see videos, you see it in 4K, and you can actually study the rock work if you really care and look to see how the tank is doing to basically see if their phosphate levels are up or not. And I recently used some more live rock enhance in my tank because some of the rock was looking a little dingy and, and pinkish, got some reddish stuff going on there that I just, want to let it eradicate. So I put some in before my trip. I'm going to do some more again today and let it kind of work on cleaning up the rock work again because I loved how clean my tank looked after using Live Rock Enhance. Uh, Mike, if Critter ID is not working right for you on your Reef Trace, try one more time. And if that doesn't work, please let them know and I'm sure they'll help you figure it out because the programmers are the guys that make it all happen. Um, Reefkeeper says, I read your article about acreating flatworms and I found some eggs at the base of one of my colonies. I removed the colony and surrounding colonies and dipped and no adult flatworms came off. Is there another pest? Um, if you found the eggs of the acreating flatworms, odds are you actually do have some acreating flatworms in some corals. If you happen to have a tricolor acropora, that is their candy. The, car the canary in a coal mine is my rule. And if you can have that tricolor in the tank and it looks like it's getting bit and getting the color sucked out of it, that is a really good way to find out 
if you have the AEFWs in your tank. Uh, one of the simple ways to clean off pests from a coral rather than pulling it out and dipping it without touching it is to take a power head like a MaxiJet, plug it into a long extension cord and just hold it and blow that coral and just long, like for 20 seconds without moving your hand and just keep hitting it and you'll see flatworms and stuff flying off and then your other fish will come up and they'll eat them. So like if you happen to have anthias, they'll devour the acridian flatworms that are blowing loose. Another trick that you can use in the tank if you want to try it, turn off all the flow in the tank, get a glass of RODI water and a turkey baster and suck up the turkey baster, you know, filled with RODI and then baste the coral slowly and just send that clear water to cocoon that coral and if there's flatworms, they'll all peel off. It's really crazy. And then your fish will dart over and eat it. And of course, when you're, after a couple of minutes, move your hand back and forth to kind of mix the water with the salt water so it's not sitting in, you know, the coral's not sitting in fresh water for a long time. And then you can restart the, the flow. But that's a couple of methods. And if you do find eggs, one of the simplest solutions to getting rid of them, rather than trying to scrape off every egg because you need to get rid of every last egg if that's your infestation, is to, like, let's say you have a colony and right here at the base are these eggs. I would cut the colony and I'd save all the top part and I would throw away the base and replant it. And that way you don't run the risk of some of the eggs getting past you because it just takes one to start the cycle over and have another nightmare on your hands. Yeah, if you, um, I don't know of another species that lays eggs that looks like that. I did have a, a I have a very brief video, which I'm gonna have to drop into something on YouTube at some point. I found these, uh, the fish store by me has a huge reef tank, 450 gallons, and he had these horrible pests destroying his acros, and he was really, really upset. And he said, they're black bugs. And I went up there, I said, show me these black bugs. I haven't seen black bugs in person. And he showed it to me, and I was like, they're not even black, they're purple. And I said, and they don't look like bugs, they look like slugs. And so I, sh I filmed and took a few pictures of it with my iPhone because it was in my pocket. <laughs> and I thought I'd come back with my camera and get some really good macro shots. And when I came back, the tank was completely empty. It was just rock and fish. Every coral was gone. He completely uh, removed every bit of coral so that they had nothing to feed on so they would starve to death and die. And I was like, man, I mean, basically I consider that a, uh, I mean, yes, will it fix the problem? Sure. But that is what I would consider an overreaction. I, I'm not reactive that way. I don't just decimate a tank because there's a pest. Just like I don't blow up a house and level it to the ground because I found roaches. You know, you kill the bug and you enjoy the house. And so in his case, these little uh, purple looking flatworm things or whatever they were, nudibranchs, I don't know what they were, tiny little things, but they didn't have eggs like an acroating flatworm. They were their own shape. And I just don't think you're gonna find the exact type of egg from a different creature necessarily. But, you know, who knows? Maybe you're misjudging the size of the eggs that you're seeing in my article with what you're seeing in your tank. They, you might have larger ones coming from snails. Just <laughs> regular snails are laying eggs because they want to make more snails, and you're thinking, oh, no, I have a pest that's destroying my coral, and it was just a coincidence. Could, maybe that's a possibility. I don't know. I feel like you've got some good experience. I've seen your name for some time now. But bottom line is we want to remove what we are concerned about so that the rest of the tank will do well. Um, we got six minutes left. So let's see what else. Um, H2O NCL says my PO4 is 0.1 to 0.3. I can't bring it down. Phosphate RX will bring it down, and it's what I've been recommending for a very long time and what I've been using in my own tank for over 10 years. And it's super easy to use. I, uh, I talk with other hobbyists, and they say, yes, Mark, I started using Phosphate RX. Uh, because of, because you showed it and it's so simple and it absolutely worked for me and uh, that's that's really what this is all about helping each other figure out solutions so that way we can help each other be more successful with our tanks but phosphate rx is something you dose directly in the tank and the skimmer and or a filter sock that's 10 microns or smaller will trap the particulates and the next day you'll have much less or even no phosphate left in the water and it can start building up again are you still testing against the Trident? Yeah, uh, James, I do choose to pull out my test kits and do my own tests. 
the alkalinity matches my test kit perfectly. Calcium, the trident says I'm higher than my test kit, and magnesium trident says I'm higher than my test kit. So I need to do some more homework. I need to actually use my test kit on their calibration solution and see if my test kit measures the exact same number as theirs. And if it doesn't, then I'm probably believing in test kits that I shouldn't be believing in, and I should just trust the trident. So <laughs> that's it. But yeah, I am comparing. I am looking at other things to see if they are the same number, because I really want them to match. You know, I love the automated testing. I, I tell people this all the time. I get to be lazier and yet more informed or better informed, and I love that. And it's so nice to every six hours, I'm like, oh, it's 6.30. What's the alkalinity? What's the calcium? What's the magnesium? And it just shows me the numbers, and I, I know whether I need to dose something or not or adjust the calcium reactor or not. So that's super convenient for me. But at the same time, I want to know that the numbers are accurate because, and I'm not, <clears throat> I'm speaking as Mark Levinson, you know, just my opinion. If, and this is a huge if, if the test is measuring higher than what it really is, and we believe that number to be true, then we would not add more of the solution because we think we have enough. Does that make sense? So if you believe the trident is saying that your magnesium is 1400, you would think I don't need to add any magnesium because my number is always 14. It's 1398, it's 1402. You know, it's like, I don't need to add it. But, and I'm just saying, but theoretically, if the trident was measuring higher than reality of magnesium, let's say magnesium in my tank is really 1200, but I'm always seeing a reading of 1400 on the trident. My thought process is, well, I would always see 14, so I wouldn't add any. And I'm looking at corals and they're not happy. And I'm like, well, I don't understand because my magnesium is perfect. See what I'm saying? I mean, that's what I'm saying. I want to know for a fact my number's right. So of course, one of the choices I have is to uh, document what the trident measured, uh, put that somewhere on a sticky, stick it on the wall, <laughs> scoop some water on my tank, send it off for ICP testing, wait for that to come back and see if that number measures the trident. That would be a great way to feel reassured because I have done ICP tests and when I did my ICP test, my 400 gallon four months ago, which is also in my blogs, uh, you'll see that my calcium and my magnesium measured very, very closely, almost suspiciously closely to my ELOS test kit result. So I tend to believe my ELOS test kit, but like I said, I'm not trying to disparage it because even they're like, well, how do you know ELOS is rising? Like, well, my ICP test seemed to back up my ELOS and they said, well, you next need to test ELOS against our calibration solution, which I have not done yet. So it's too soon for me to say anything one way or another. These are just opinions and thoughts and wonderings on my part and nothing more. Uh, I'm totally believing the numbers I'm getting. I just kind of want to know for a fact that I'm 100% right in believing them, if that makes sense. I don't know. Does that feel like double talk? It might feel like it, but it's not meant that way. Uh, someone asked, is it... Uh, no. I would not say that a soft coral is more temperamental than an SPS. I think soft corals are going to be one of the hardiest corals you'll have, and finger corals are just just a leather, and leathers are easy. Everyone can grow a leather. I have some in the back of my tank. If you need some, let me know. <laughs> I say to let me know. Uh, please let me know you're coming by to pick it up so I don't have to deal with shipping because I don't want to do that. All right, we're down to the last uh, minute and a half. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in this week. And I'm going to be working on my new sump and uh, knocking out a few orders for customers, of course, and answering questions from you guys online and posting my water test results and editing some videos. So there is some stuff coming out this week. You're definitely going to see some videos rolling out. So that's something to look forward to. And you know, I apologize that you've had to wait this long, but there's only one of me and only so many hours in the day, and I use them all. <laughs> It's amazing I get any sleep at all. So I do appreciate you guys tuning in. And, uh, you know, if you liked the stream, I hope you hit a thumbs up. I know it's really late in the stream to ask for that at this point. But, uh, you know, the likes and the comments and the shares, they always help a channel grow. And this channel has been growing quietly and organically now for, you know, several years. And it's doing really well. And I'm very happy with the audience. I'm very happy with the group that I have here. We are a bunch of nice people. And there's not a lot of hatred and, and, and negativity being posted, which is awesome. I, I appreciate positivity and treating others the way I want to be treated. 
and so I try to go out of my way to make sure I'm always keeping the peace, addressing the question, not attacking the person, and keeping everyone happy. And I guess on that point, I should definitely drop this on the screen too, that we have a great group on Facebook that is called Club Milo's Reef, and we answer questions all day long there. And it's free to use, and it's full of people that are helpful, and we are not there to judge you or put you down, and we don't even allow it. So feel free to join the group if you haven't yet. And uh, if not, maybe you'll find me on Instagram, and if not there, you'll just keep finding me here on YouTube. That's it. I see you three, two, one. So have a great weekend, and happy Father's Day to all you dads. Bye, guys.